speakers, not yours. Right. Uh, <laughs> <coughs> Good afternoon and welcome to a special City Club Forum here at the Global Center for Health Innovation. My name is Jeff Pollack, President of the Board of the Woodruff Foundation and a longtime member of the City Club. It is my honor to welcome you to our event today, a conversation with international mental health advocate, Dr. Vikram Patel. Dr. Patel is the Pershing Square Professor of Global Health at Harvard and recognized as one of the world's 100 most influential people by Time Magazine in 2015. He is here to talk to us today about mental illness and its impact throughout the world. He's the co-founder and former director of the Center for Global Mental Health at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, co-director of the Center for Control of Chronic Conditions at the Public Health, Health Foundation in, of India, and co-founder of Sangrath, an Indian NGO dedicated to research in the areas of child development, adolescent health, and mental health. Dr. Patel is a leading voice advocating for millions of people worldwide afflicted by mental illness. He's committed to the education of the public and reducing the stigma of mental illness through policy, scientific study, development of training programs, speaking engagements, and teaching. Even though he is engaged in all of these big things, he's still thinking small about the smaller communities that are affected by mental health issues throughout the world and the seemingly small organizations in those communities that save lives through mental health care. Dr. Patel has committed his career to closing what he refers to as the treatment gap in the developing world and believes the solutions to this problem is through empowering ordinary people and community health workers to de deliver that health care. He co-founded Sangath in 1996, an NGO in Ga'a Ga to do just that. Today, it is one of the largest NGOs in that state of India with more than 100 service providers and two centers to provide professional health care services to a previously overlooked community. In 2012, at a TED Talk, Dr. Patel called upon us to dare to care for those who know, we know who are affected by mental illness. For decades, Dr. Patel has shown us how to dare to care, and today he is here to tell us how. I understand that his mother wanted her bright young son to become a neurosurgeon and not a psychiatrist. Fortunately for us, he did not, he did not obey her wishes. Ladies and gentlemen, members of the community, it brings me great pleasure to welcome Dr. Patel to Cleveland and to the City Club. Thank you very much for that wonderful introduction. Sometimes when I hear these introductions, I feel like at my, I'm at my funeral. But I'm, I'm, thank you, it was very gracious uh, and very accurate. Um, I'd like to thank Dan and the City Club for this wonderful opportunity. As a fresh arrival uh, to your country, I uh, feel always humbled when I'm invited to speak at events like this. Um, as an academic, um, it's a rare opportunity for me to speak to an audience that comprises such a diverse group of people as yourselves. And I believe this is exactly the kind of audience that we need to be taking the discourse of public health more generally and mental health more particularly. For I don't believe that health is a subject that should be in the hands of medical professionals alone. Uh, health is far too important for that. And perhaps that is even truer for mental health. Friends, I'm going to be talking about the black dog. And I think given that this is an audience that seems to largely comprise people who already know what the black dog might be, that kind of breaks a little bit about my, uh, my punchline. But nevertheless, I shall play through that punchline. Uh, most students of people uh, of global health will be familiar with the word the black death. 
that uh, described the terrible plagues that were ravaging Europe um, many centuries ago and killing hundreds of millions of people. <clears throat> In my view, the Black Dog is the Black Death of modern times. Now, some of you uh, who are not familiar with this term, or even those of you who are familiar with it, would wonder who was the first person who coined this particular term. Well, it was this man, Samuel Johnson, uh, a fairly well-known uh, medieval English writer, who wrote about the black dog in many of his different essays uh, and books. And here I've extracted one particular uh, piece of writing from one of uh, those various books. And I thought uh, it's quite evocative of what uh, Samuel Johnson describes as a very deeply personal and very private experience that was very distressing. Uh, Night comes at last, he writes, and some hours of restless and confusion bring me again to a day of solitude. What shall exclude the black dog from a habitation like this? But to be fair, most people don't know that Samuel Johnson was the first person to use these words in any, uh, in any form. In fact, most people think that the black dog was first used by this man, Britain's wartime prime minister. Certainly, I did think that black dog was first used by Winston Churchill. Churchill, for all his prowess as a great prime minister who took Britain through to victory in World War II, uh, also described in his private diaries and wrote quite extensively, in fact, in his private diaries about the black dog. He wrote that quite without warning, he would suddenly be afflicted by periods in his life when he would seemingly lose all interest in his work. This was a man who was a workaholic. And yet, during these periods of the black dog, he lost interest in even going to parliament. He would sit at home, restless, irritable, unable to focus on anything, unable to sleep, feeling tired a lot of the time. And then, <clears throat> without, just in the same way that, that the black dog, as it were, afflicted him out of the blue, it would disappear out of the blue. But sometimes, it would take months for the black dog to actually lift. Now, we don't know whether Churchill actually consulted a physician specifically for the black dog. He certainly consulted physicians for a number of the complaints that he associated with the black dog. And we will never know whether Churchill, had he seen a mental health professional today, whether he would have received a diagnosis of depression. Certainly when you read his descriptions of the black dog, you will recognize immediately that his description is a very vivid description of what we call depression. But it wouldn't surprise me if he, in fact, did have depression. Not only because of the description in his diaries, but because we know today that depression is by far and away the most common mental health condition that afflicts mankind. In fact, it's probably one of the most common health conditions that afflicts mankind. Approximately 5% of the world's population at any given point in time would be affected by depression of some severity or another. Now, this is therefore a very common condition. Yet, 25 years ago, when I began my work on this subject, first in Southern Africa, where I lived for a few years, and then in India, I was often confronted by policymakers, by people in the community, by my colleagues in the healthcare uh, uh, provider uh, uh, sector. I was often confronted, confronted with the idea that this was, in fact, not a health condition at all. The sorts of challenges that were put forward to me were listed here on this slide. For example, I was often challenged about the fact that what I call depression was simply an extension of social suffering. It was simply an extension of the miseries of everyday life. Some people would say, well, since I was trained in Britain and now working in Africa or Asia, that I was carrying Western ideas about this condition to other parts of the world. Some people still do say that even now. And others would say that since the intention of the world was largely on diseases of the poor or diseases that kill, depression didn't really deserve any attention because it was a disease of the rich and depression didn't kill. So over the past two and a half decades, colleagues of mine from around the world and myself have been building a science base to really test whether these assumptions were true or false. And over the next few slides, I will briefly summarize what that very robust science base tells us about depression in the global context. 
The first kind of evidence is to do with the actual burden of depression globally. And for this, we must turn to the global burden of disease work led by the University of Washington in Seattle. In 1995, when they reported their first global burden of disease, they found that about 2% of the total burden of disease in women and about 1% in men was attributable to depression. Now, mind you, this might seem like a small proportion, but this is a proportion of every human health condition, everything from the flu through to cancer. In fact, even in 1995, depression was in the top three leading causes of the burden of disease in women and in the top 10 for men. 25 years later, the latest report of the global burden of disease reports a significant increase in that relative proportion, about 50% increase in the last two and a half decades. And of course, in part, this is because the world's population is aging. And as the proportion of us who grow out of childhood and into adolescence, the highest risk group for the onset of depression uh, grows, therefore also uh, the proportion uh, of the burden of disease due to depression will grow. The second kind of evidence is the relationship between disadvantage and deprivation with depression. This has been of a particular interest of mine and I've along with many other colleagues, examined the relationship between people living in a variety of different forms of disadvantage, uh, poverty in its myriad forms, uh, absolute poverty, but also other kinds of deprivation, such as, for example, exclusion from the mainstream of society for minority populations, or exposure to conflict and trauma, which is altogether too common these days. And looking at the relationship between these determinants, and mental ill health. And what we found is a very strong association that was mediated by two pathways. Firstly, the very condition of poverty itself increased the risk of developing a mental health problem, particularly depression. But importantly, when you had a mental health problem like depression, you were more likely to slide into poverty, for example, because you were unable as Churchill was, to go to work. Except in Churchill's case, of course, he had a regular government job that kept paying him even though he didn't go to work. Most of us actually continue to have to go to work if we're gonna get paid for that particular day. The third kind of evidence is about the impact of depression on other people. Now, one of the great challenges of working in the mental health area is that we don't have an objective marker. We have no blood test. We can't do an x-ray. We can't do a scan that can tell us this person has this condition with the same facility as physicians in other areas of medicine can. And therefore, because it can't be measured objectively, it doesn't exist as a real entity in our minds. So one way to look at whether it is a real entity is to ask the question, does depression in one person affect another person? Because if it did, that would make this invisible entity a little bit more real. Now, if we know what the features of depression are, fatigue, lack of concentration, an inability to enjoy life and do the things you need to do, one particular instance in which depression may affect another person is in mothers. Because, of course, the mother is the most critical person in the newborn's life. And if a mother is depressed, you would imagine or expect that there might be some consequences on the well-being of the newborn. And in the world today, the single leading cause of newborn ill health is undernutrition. It is a major global health priority. So we set about asking the question about 15 years ago now in India in a study to ask the question, are babies of mothers who are depressed more likely to be underweight or stunted than babies of other mothers in the same community who are not depressed? And indeed, we did find a very strong association. Since then, and this is a, uh, a review of 17 studies from a variety of developing countries involving more than 10,000 mother-infant dyads that were put together for this report. And it observed that the risk of being underweight or stunted was about 40 to 50% higher if your mother was depressed as compared to if your mother was not in the same community. A very strong association between maternal depression and a very hard, tangible, objective health outcome in her newborn baby. And finally, let's interrogate the assumption that depression is not a killer disease. 
Well, if we're to look at the Global Burden of Disease report, the number of deaths that are attributed to depression can be seen on the slide. Yes, the answer is zero. But of course, this isn't surprising because no physician will ever write on a cause of death certificate, he died because he was depressed. Typically, the cause of death will be something more immediate. He died because he was drinking too heavily and had liver cirrhosis. Or he died because he had a heart attack. Or he died because he committed suicide. Incredibly, even suicide is not attributed to depression in the way we count cause of death statistics. So we asked the Global Burden of Disease folks to recalculate the excess deaths that would be expected to happen due to a variety of different causes in people who are depressed, and the number was staggering. More than 2 million deaths each year globally can be attributed to excess mortality in people who are depressed. Now, of course, as is often the case, artists can predict what we scientists actually spend years trying to prove, as John Steinbeck wrote very wonderfully in this classic book, a sad soul can kill you much quicker than a germ can. So it seems we were armed with all this wonderful science about the burden and impact of depression, and I took this to the policymakers at the World Bank, for example, I have a very vivid memory of that about a decade and a half ago, as well as to governments around the world and saying, hey guys, this is a condition for which we need to act, and we need to act now, and I was thrown a new challenge. Well, that's all very well, Dr. Patel and all your colleagues, you've shown all this stuff, uh, but the problem is that we really don't have mental health professionals. We have insufficient numbers of mental health professionals, and even if we do, they're too darn expensive, uh, and most of them want to live and work in big cities. So therefore, most of the world's population simply will not have access to such care for the foreseeable future. So this was a new challenge, and about a decade ago, we had to refocus our science agenda away from describing the impact of depression to figuring out a solution in places where there were no mental health professionals. So I looked around me, and I looked around and said, well, that's correct, we don't have psychiatrists, we don't have psychologists, we don't have social workers, but what we do have is a heck of a lot of people. And therefore, rather than asking the question, how do we get more of the people we don't have, could we turn the question around to, how do we use the people we do have in a more efficient and effective way? And so about 15 years ago, we started experimenting with using the people we do have people from off the streets, in the communities in which we were working, to see if we could effectively deliver the known interventions, predominantly psychological therapies, in the hands of these people with appropriate training and supervision. I wasn't the only one. Three of the landmark randomized controlled trials, the holy grail of medicine, the kind of scientific experiments that all physicians will accept is the mark of evidence were conducted in rural Uganda, rural Pakistan, and rural India. These were the earliest studies that demonstrated that you could effectively deliver psychological treatments for depression and anxiety in the hands of completely untrained people. Untrained in terms of the fact that they had no prior health professional training. Of course, they were trained to deliver the psychological therapy. Of course, they were supervised but they had no prior health training before the end of the program. Now, you might think that these were three isolated experiments. And therefore, last year, we carried out a search of the entire literature to identify, since these earliest studies, had other people been experimenting with this particular approach of using ordinary people? This is an astonishing evidence base. 27 randomized controlled trials, that number has now shot up to 32 randomized controlled trials, of lay people delivering psychological therapies for anxiety, depressive, and trauma-related disorders in 22 different low- and middle-income countries. By my reckoning, this is the largest body of scientific evidence in any area of medicine in the global south for any particular health condition. What this large body of evidence is telling us is that we have to reimagine what mental health care looks like, completely 
a root and branch reimagination in four very different ways. First of all, what actually comprises a psychological or a mental health care intervention? In the highly professionalized worlds that we find ourselves in this country, for example, we have divvied up and fragmented people's mental health care needs into multiple different providers. For your medication needs, you go here. For your psychological needs, you go there. For your social welfare needs, you go there. Now, the wonderful thing about innovating in a low resource place is that none of these people actually exist. And therefore, you have to define an intervention that is holistic, by necessity, not out of choice. And a holistic intervention is therefore one that is automatically person-centered, the word that's become very trendy these days. Because when you have a mental health problem, your needs span many different domains. They span your symptoms, but they also span your feelings, they span your intimate relationships, and above all, they span the social world you live in. And to be told that you need to see multiple different people who don't exist is clearly not tenable. And therefore, we have got to rethink the nature of a mental health intervention as being a comprehensive one. Where is it delivered? I find it always very surprising that mental health professionals, and indeed health professionals more generally, think about the right place to deliver care is where they work. Especially for a chronic condition, that seems so odd. Consider what has happened that has revolutionized TB treatment globally. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the fact that TB, of course, is a chronic disease. Some people need treatment for anywhere from nine to 24 months. How do we deliver treatment? The patient doesn't come to the clinic. The clinic goes to the patient. Direct observe it, uh, observed, directly observed tuberculosis therapy, DOTS, is in fact the greatest innovation in improving TB outcomes. It involves going to people's houses and delivering treatment to them. That's exactly what we've been doing globally for psychotherapy and other long-term medical treatments for, for, for mental health problems. Who provides this intervention? Well, I've already described to you, whoever is available. Whoever is available and has an interest in mental health care, whoever then meets the competency standards following training, of course, it's not just whoever is available. There is a very formal procedure to build competency and who will work, in the final point, within a team a team that literally comprises the person and his or her family at the heart of our attention, but always includes a primary care physician or a nurse practitioner if they are available. And in those places where mental health professionals are available, uh, that individual will ensure quality assurance. So this is what I might refer to as a collaborative approach uh, uh, to the delivery model. So we have this great evidence, and it is having impact. Last year, the World Bank produced this report that I led on mental substance abuse and neurological disorders that has a series of recommendations for governments to adopt uh, interventions for mental health and neurological problems. And a, one of the key recommendations is the one that I showed you in the previous slide. And perhaps most excitingly, years of science and advocacy have finally led to the inclusion of mental health in the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Many of you will know the UN set the agenda for global development in 2000 with the Millennium Development Goals, and that had a 15-year uh, uh, period of life. And so in 2015, the, all the nations of the world agreed to a fresh set of goals called the Sustainable Development Goals, expanding the MDGs into areas such as climate change, environmental protection, and so on, but very importantly, acknowledging that health went beyond infectious diseases. And on this slide, uh, it just illustrates three specific health targets in which mental health and substance use conditions are now included in the SDGs. And it's important to remember why this is so critical, because countries that have signed the SDGs, which is virtually every country in the world, now have to mandatorily report on their progress in achieving the sorts of targets that the SGG set out. All right, so science has worked so far so good. So much, I think. What a fool I am. Let's look at the reality check here. The reality check remains that in spite of all this science, even in rich countries, 50% of the population with a clinically diagnosable mental health condition has not received any care at all in the last 12 months. And Incredibly, in the richest middle-income countries, India and China, 90% of people with depression have not received any of these interventions. 
And when people do receive mental health care, this is what mental health care looks like in many parts of the world. And these are recent images of mental hospitals in different parts of the world. Now imagine for a moment, if these were pictures of hospitals for people with HIV or people with cardiac disease, and you would be outraged that this sort of care continues under the name of mental health care is a blot on humanity. But of course, the bars may look very different. For I discovered after arriving in this country that maybe mental hospitals don't exist in the same way as they do in Asia and Africa. <coughs> but a significant proportion of people who need mental health care are instead incarcerated in the prison system. And if we look at how much compassion there is in terms of the development assistance that foundations are giving to mental health in the developing world, here you can see the dollars per burden of disease daily for different health conditions, such as HIV AIDS on the left, and you can see that's a skyscraper. And on the right, you can see the figure for mental health. Yes, when actually scaled against the HIV graph, it doesn't even appear on the plot. Clearly, science isn't enough. Science has gone as far as it can, in my view, in trying to change hearts and minds to feel compassion and care for people with mental health problems. We're going to have to look elsewhere for a solution to this. And I have been very heavily inspired by the story of HIV AIDS. I worked in my earliest stage of my career in the mid-90s and early 90s in Zimbabwe, which was then only being recognized as the epicenter of the HIV AIDS epidemic. And I could see it every day in my clinical work in the teaching hospital there, when my patients who had mental health problems were dying every day of this mysterious disease. Those were the years when you had people who argued exactly as they do regarding mental health, that people in poor countries really couldn't afford life-saving treatments. Mind you, by the 1990s, uh, people in this country were surviving with HIV AIDS due to antiretrovirals, but not where I was working. We had people advocating only prevention, that people who already had AIDS should be left to die now, because the health system was too weak, couldn't afford these treatments. This outrage continued till 2000. In 2000, the World Health Organization finally agreed that people who could have had their lives saved had the right to have their lives saved. No matter how much it cost, no matter what needed to be done to the health system to fix it, we couldn't let people die. And when I look back on the science, the science was already there. But it wasn't the science alone that made this dramatic shift of HIV from being a deadly disease to being a chronic disease. What changed was civil society action. And that action came not from scientists, but from people living with HIV AIDS. This banner was unfurled in 1998, December 10th. Uh, it is also International Human Rights Day in the streets of Johannesburg, another country, uh, a city in another country that's been very badly affected by the HIV AIDS pandemic. This was led by the Treatment Action Campaign, a remarkable civil society organization led by a remarkable man, Zaki Ahmad, who had the privilege of meeting uh, Zaki always told me that, in fact, quite interesting on a, as an aside, that it wasn't the HIV that he suffered from that was the worst suffering. It was the depression that he lived with it was actually much worse than the HIV. And incredibly, for a man with HIV, he felt that depression was a more hidden and stigmatized condition than HIV AIDS was. Nevertheless, he led from the front as a man with HIV AIDS he swore that he would not take antiretroviral drugs until all the people of his country had access to these drugs. He shamed the South African government, drug companies, and a variety of other governments around the world that denied access to care and opened the door to a revolution that we, I, I actually think, is the basis of the uh, evolution of global health as a discipline today. It is with this in mind that <clears throat> in 1998, sorry, 2008, uh, we launched the Movement for Global Mental Health, a movement that really seeks to emulate the success of the HIV AIDS movement by bringing together scientists like myself, practitioners like many of you here, and most importantly, people affected by mental health problems and their families at the heart 
of this movement. And I'm so delighted that this movement is currently led by this remarkable woman, again from South Africa, Charlene Sankel, who has been living with schizophrenia for the last 20 years of her life. She now runs the, uh, the Movement for Global Mental Health from Johannesburg. Uh, and I think it's a remarkable testimony to her own resilience that she's leading such a large global network uh, with a tremendous professionalism uh, and, and inspiration. I started my talk and, uh, with, uh, with one European Prime Minister and I want to, as I close, uh, end with another European Prime Minister. I don't know uh, whether any of you recognize this man. He's not as recognizable as Churchill, of course. Uh, nevertheless, he was also a prime minister in Europe, Mr. Kjell Bondovic, uh, who was the prime minister of Norway. I had the great privilege of meeting Mr. Bondovic uh, a few years ago uh, at a talk at the World Health Organization. And Mr. Bondovic told us about his story, his tryst with depression. He described how in the late 90s, when he was prime minister of Norway, he developed depression. He went to his physician. The physician said you were depressed and you needed to actually recover. You needed time off work. You shouldn't be running Norway when you're actually depressed. <laughs> That's good advice, isn't it? So unlike what most people would do, that is to say they would tell their employer, well, of course, his employer were the people of Norway, that, you know, I, 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 I've got a cold, I need to take some time off, or I'm taking a holiday, or, or some such excuse. He actually went on television and announced to the people of Norway that he was depressed. And as Norwegians do when they're depressed, he was going off to his cabin in the north of Norway uh, with his family and his therapist uh, available on Skype and his little bag of pills and he was going to recover in six to 12 weeks. And in the interim, his, uh, one of his ministers was going to be in charge. So he went off. And as people with depression with appropriate care do, he recovered. He came back. He took on the reins of government. This being Norway, she just gave it up so nicely. This if it was some other countries, that would not have happened. Um, but what's really remarkable about this story is that two years later, he stood for election and won with an even bigger majority. And it shows to me that when you are honest and when you disclose, most people react with compassion. Most people do not react with hate. And indeed, this is exactly what Mr. Bondovic said in the talk that I've actually paraphrased here. The stigma is the main problem regarding our efforts to improve the mental health situation in our countries. I want to contribute to combating stigma, and he believes that the only way, or the most powerful way, rather, to combating stigma is through disclosure, through speaking about your own story, through feeling open about talking about your mental health problem or that in your family, because that is the one way that you can actually embrace mental health problems in our community. It is for this reason this year when the World Health Organization celebrated a World Health Day, which is uh, on April 7th each year, very rarely is mental health the focus of World Health Day. This year it was depression, and I love the theme they chose because the theme is exactly right. Let's talk, not just talk to our therapists, but to each other about mental health problems. I urge you, for those of you who want to be involved with this global conversation, in February next year, Charlene will be hosting with a very large number of nonprofit organizations, many from the US, uh, that have joined hands for the fifth summit of the Movement for Global Mental Health. Um, and a key element of these summits is leadership by people with mental health problems, speaking about their own experiences, and very importantly, in a spirit of solidarity with professionals and practitioners. I want to end now by just thinking about, as a new arrival in this country, what is the relevance of all this work that my colleagues and I have been doing in very low resource countries to countries such as this one? And I want to draw back, uh, uh, just, just to circle back to the slide I showed you earlier about the treatment gap. What is astonishing is that the treatment gap is so huge, even in countries such as this, which have a hundred to a thousand times more resources of every possible kind, from beds to clinics to professionals, than any of the countries I have worked in. And I believe the reason for this is because the interventions that we're providing are over-professionalized. This is provocative and maybe something we can discuss. I believe they become too medicalized, we deliver them in settings using language and using concepts that alienate and sometimes scare and frighten ordinary people. And it's almost like as if we want to, as it were, hive off mental health from the population. 
We want to make it our own professional domain. And I think in all of these ways, the innovations happening in places where there are no mental health professionals may sometimes be very helpful for those who are working in high resource countries. Whatever the case may be, the moral imperative for mental health in the era of sustainable development, and here I would say that the sustainable development goals are not only for developing countries, they're for all countries of the world. And as far as mental health is concerned, it would be fair to say that no country is a developed country. Leaving no one behind is the slogan of the SDGs. And if we are to achieve that, we're gonna need to include people with mental health problems. And if we're gonna achieve that, we're gonna have to start making mental health for all, by all, a reality. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, I'm Dan Malthrop, Chief Executive at the City Club of Cleveland, and today we're enjoying a special forum with Dr. Vikram Patel, Pershing Square Professor of Global Health at Harvard University. We are here together at the Global Center for Health Innovation. We're about to begin the audience Q&A, and we welcome questions from everyone, City Club members, guests, students, those of you joining us via our webcast. If you'd like to tweet a question, please tweet it at the City Club, and our staff will work it into the program. We do want to remind you that your questions should be brief and to the point. Holding our microphones today, our content coordinator, Teddy Eisenberg, and our director of programming, Stephanie Jansky. Do we have our first question? Because if we don't, I'll start it. So Dr. Patel, I'm gonna start with the first question because there's a shy audience uh, here, but um, have you ever dealt yourself with mental health problems? Yeah, absolutely. Um, of course I have. My mother, for example, has had, uh, well, she's no longer, uh, she's not no longer with us now, um, but she had depression. And here's the interesting story since you asked that question. Um, I was already trained as a psychiatrist. I was working in Zimbabwe then, and I was visiting my mom in India. Uh, and I noticed she was, you know, in bed the whole day, um, and she had diabetes. And so I thought it was her diabetes that was creating the fatigue. <coughs> and her diabetic doctor had left instructions with my mom uh, to say that when I was visiting, uh, I should m make contact with him. So I went across to see him. I thought he wanted to speak about the diabetes. Uh, it turned out he said, son, uh, you know, he was much senior to me, he said, son, uh, you need to talk to your mom because I think she's depressed. <laughs> I looked at him and said, you've got to be kidding. Because I couldn't see it in my own mom. Maybe because I didn't want to see it in my own mom. It was easier to deal with this diabetes thing because there was something, you know, physical about it. But this depression thing, even though I was a psychiatrist and working in this area, for God's sake, I couldn't see it in my own mother. So I went home and I had this great memory of sitting with my mom and spending a half an hour interviewing her as if I was a physician and discovering that she was one of the most depressed people I'd ever interviewed. Uh, and so anyway, you know, I had to, I, 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 being her son, I, couldn't I wouldn't want to treat her, so I got a colleague involved, etc. And then she bounced back six weeks later. I remember her telling me, or 12 weeks later, that she felt as if her life had returned. She felt as if the light had returned to her life. That was the exact words in Hindi uh, that she used. Um, and I, I, I just was amazed. Uh, I was astonished, actually, that I could have missed it. And it struck me at that time how, in fact, we don't see the obvious because we fear it or because we're embarrassed by it. And we have to break out of that. Hi, uh, I'm uh, Dr. Putt. I'm a physician in uh, internal medicine, currently working at Metro Health. I'm also an alumni from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, and it's my wife's idea to invite you here. <laughs> um, I have a couple of questions. I don't know which one to begin with, but I'll start with uh, one a comment my psychiatry professor told me uh, when I was in medical school. He said uh, in the 1950s to now in the United States, uh, suicide rates have not changed despite all the inventions and changes in institutionalization, deinstitutionalization in the United States. So my question, first question would be, is there any evidence that any of the interventions will actually decrease in a developed country or developing country, the suicide rates or, or uh, morbidity and mortality? The second one uh, I'd have to say is, it's, I'm glad you mentioned diabetes, particularly as an internal medicine physician, I have to say the most difficult patient population to deal with is diabetics with mental illness. Uh, the, the, I feel like there's no hope if they have uncontrolled mental illness, they come in for ketoacidosis or, 
what have you, and uh, they just keep coming back and back and back and back, and then have an untimely early death. Um, or if they take their medications, they get very overweight from the schizophrenic medications, uh, and that is very complicated too. So I guess the question is, is there any specific research on diabetes and mental illness, and is there a way to account for excess diabetic deaths due to mental illness? Because that might be a number if you're looking to, how many, to prove how many people die from mental illness would be complicating those two. Thanks. So there are two quite different questions. Um, I'll take the first one, suicide. Um, I think it's important to recognize that suicide is not only the product of mental illness. Uh, I think it's not the best indicator about the quality of mental health care in a population because suicide, as you know well, is also affected by very important social factors. Uh, you know, unemployment, recession, um, conflict, all of these larger social uh, factors also heavily influence suicide. Um, a lot of suicides are impulsive, especially in younger people. And no amount of great mental illness treatment is ever going to completely prevent those. You need actually different paradigms of promotion of mental health uh, to actually address suicide. Uh, my understanding, though, of suicide is that the rates have fallen in most Western countries. I, I'm not familiar with the U.S. particularly, but I certainly know in Britain um, the uh, suicide rate has plummeted uh, from the 60s to where it is today. Uh, so I think actually certain public health approaches to suicide can bring suicide rates down, but that has to go beyond just the treatment of mental illness. That will only play uh, some role, uh, maybe not even the, uh, a major role. Um, so what, what might that include? For example, with young people, that would include uh, a school-based curricula that actually build life skills for uh, uh, management of difficult e emotions, what's often called uh, uh, um, training in emotional and social competencies. So that's an example of uh, a much more population-wide intervention rather than a clinical one. The issue of diabetes and mental illness is a very important one, especially for people with serious mental illness. I think you were referring to that population, mainly because they often have uh, medications that themselves are uh, uh, potentially diabetogenic. So I think the right approach for, for, for people with serious mental illness is to have a one-stop shop, exactly as, as for all people with serious mental illness, one place where you can get uh, all your multiple needs addressed, uh, uh, your medical and your psychiatric needs concurrently addressed alongside with uh, a variety of other needs like employment and livelihoods. And this morning I had the great pleasure of visiting uh, Magnolia House. Uh, I don't know where they're, they're sitting somewhere here. Uh, oh, there they are, yes. Uh, uh, one of the clubhouse, uh, one of the members of the clubhouse network. And I saw a, a really fantastic example in your own community of exactly what that kind of one-stop shop could look like. A place where someone could go feel part of, not be patronized, um, be an equal member, a stakeholder in a facility in which you have multiple needs being met uh, at in the same location. I have a question over here. You just talked about the stigma of mental health disorders and uh, the denial, the lack of awareness. So it seems to me that a huge focus on educating people is essential so that the general population understands this as a disease. What do you recommend occurring first relating to an education strategy to close the gap? So um, I'd say two things here. First of all, in terms of education, I still think that disclosure uh, having people who have had a personal experience of mental health problems, uh, and also more, perhaps more powerfully, stories of recovery uh, are probably the most powerful ways of communicating. But I will say one thing, this has to go beyond celebrity endorsements. Um, I, I think celebrity endorsements are very important, um, but sometimes they perpetuate the idea that mental health problems are celebrity problems, uh, and that poor people in disadvantaged situations you know, they don't really have mental health problems because really the problem is their social situation. It's almost as if the entitlement to have a mental health problem can only come if you're rich because otherwise you don't have, uh, you know, you, there's no other external factor that can explain it. But having said this, I do think that some of the paradigms we use for mental illness are too restrictive and too biomedical. And I want to go back to my earlier point. I think we need to be more nuanced when we talk about mental health problems. We need to remove and dispel the notion that a mental health problem equals a mental illness that requires psychiatric care. 
in much the same way as oncologists have very nicely used a staged approach. I think neuroscientists and, and, and clinicians are increasingly seeing the value of a staged approach to mental health so that you are in different stages from wellness to disability. And depending on where you are on that dimension, you will require different intensities of interventions delivered in different places. So most people would want to be in the wellness period uh, phase, uh, and for them, self-care, healthy lifestyles, information about how you can actually promote your own mental health uh, is far more important than any clinical model of care. And yet, at the other end of this dimension, there are people with enduring and chronic problems for whom a range of different, more specialized services would be needed. So a more nuanced approach rather than a binary approach is one that I would suggest can help reduce some of the stigma. Hi, thanks. Um, I'm Jean. I'm from Neighborhood Family Practice. We're a federally qualified community health center, and we have embedded uh, behavioral health services. Um, and we also serve a wide variety of different types of folks, uh, from folks like me uh, to a large Hispanic community, as well as refugees. Um, and so I really have two questions. One has to do with the variety of different populations that we've seen in the clinic and with our embedded behavioral health. The stigma in community, in different communities, is very much present but seems to take a different form in different communities. I wondered if you could talk about differences in stigma in different populations across the world that you've seen, and also if you have any suggestions for healthcare providers about how they can work with folks who may be confronted with the fact that they just scored on their PHQ to have clinically significant depression and they want to run for the door um, when they get that type of information. Um, across, you know, like I said, the spectrum of the world. But the other thing that I've pondered uh, quite a lot as we look at trying to measure health outcomes in our organization is, do you think that lack, I, I'll just uh, reflect on an anecdote that a mental health professional that in an organization that we collaborate with said to me, do you think that mental health um, doesn't have man measurement because it can't be measured, or do you think that we're just deciding not to measure? So if you could respond to that, I, that would also be extremely helpful. Thank you. Uh, so let me, uh, the question about differences in, in stigma. I have worked in only a few places, and I can, I'll just draw on them. Uh, I think the biggest differences in stigma I have observed is between more rural and more urban populations rather than between different cultural groupings. Uh, so for example, in India, when I go to villages, everyone knows everyone. Uh, and it, there's much less stuff hidden. You know, everyone knows who the drinker is, everyone knows who the wife beater is, everyone knows who's the person who's got perhaps intellectual difficulties, etc. In fact, I have this, uh, uh, this story I often tell is that, you know, when I'm in a village in India and people discover I'm a psychiatrist, they, you know, families still in, in, in a public meeting, they will bring, a, bring their relatives and say, you know, point publicly and say, this person, you know, can you please see my wife next, you know, because, <laughs> and they're not usually joking. Uh, uh, and when I'm in an urban setting, there's secrecy. There is more to lose, it seems. There is more, more, you know, people like in big buildings that don't know their neighbors. They want to hide the fact that there is a problem with, with mental health problems in the family. I'm generalizing here, of course. Um, but I don't quite see any significant cultural differences. It's not as if, you know, Indians think like this about mental illness and, and you know, Americans think that way. I think another big differential, which also cuts across the rural urban and social class, so I think uh, amongst people I've noticed of more disadvantaged social classes, the mental health experience is inextricably linked with their social world. Um, and so oftentimes they don't quite see their mental illness as separate from their social circumstances. And I've always found it very curious when I looked at the uh, innovations that I described from the developing world. Um, what is really curious is that they're very similar innovations when you look at work being done in the U.S. with, uh, for example, African Americans. And so uh, I've, I, I've, I've been, I've been you know, not baffled, but curious why is it that exactly the same things that we're talking about in Africa or Asia seem to be the way interventions are being modified for access, improving access to African Americans or Latino populations uh, in the U.S. And I kind of wonder whether this is more of a social class issue rather than... Um, uh, than a cultural one, but I'd, I'd be happy for, to hear your thoughts since I, I'm, I'm still trying to learn. The other thing I would say about stigma is what we've tried to do use in, um, in our work with serious mental illness is the approach of befriending. 
because oftentimes just simply getting someone who has recovered to come and visit the home of the person who has been affected is sometimes very inspiring. But more than that, uh, beyond giving hope, it also actually uh, you know, uh, opportunity for another kind of intervention, which is you know, simply having someone to talk to and do things with, you know, building a social network. Um, now the issue about measurement, uh, the, the PHQ-9 question, I want to also talk to that. You know, I never tell someone who scores on a symptom scale that you have this mental illness, never. In, in none of our programs, uh, one of the big uh, issues about the content of, a psych uh, of the mental health interventions, never to use diagnostic labels. That was another point I forgot to say. So we never tell anybody, you have a mental illness called whatever. Uh, although that seems to be quite important for insurance uh, 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 billing, it's really not that useful, in my mind, always, for, every, for a person with mental illness. Sometimes it's helpful, but sometimes, oftentimes, particularly with uh, mood and anxiety disorders, it's not terribly helpful. Um, and we use language of distress. Uh, we explain what the PHQ-9 score means, for example, literally. Um, look, it looks like you've got lots of symptoms when I asked you these questions. Um, and, uh, you know, you told me this has really been affecting your life. Can we talk a little bit more about that and how we can try and address that? No need of a diagnosis at all. Um, and so, in fact, when you do that, you remove that fear, oh my God, I'm mad. Because oftentimes, the label implies something which you and I are not going to change immediately through an encounter. No, no, this is not madness, etc. No, that's something that people have internalized um, in, in the social worlds that we all grow up in. The issue of measurement is a real big challenge in the mental health sector. I think all of you will agree that the fact that we can't, as I said, we don't have an objective test is always going to be our Achilles heel. Uh, I don't think it's because we don't want to measure. I think to be honest, truth is actually our understanding of the fundamental nature of mental health problems, the experience of mental health symptoms still remains very superficial. We still rely almost entirely on self-report. Uh, and until, and you know, I, I'll acknowledge there's a huge industry of neuroscience trying to figure out whether we can get to those objective deeper uh, uh, markers or biomarkers of mental health problems. There's nothing yet that I know that is immediately ready for use in routine care. Hi, uh, my name is Sheba. I did some research at Nimhans in Bangalore, which is how I came to know about your work. I have two quick questions. Um, one, when you uh, showed the chart about the global burden of mental health disease um, between men and women over a time span, it, it seemed like the margin of increase for women was much greater. So I was wondering if you could speak to uh, why that might have been the case. Um, and the second question is uh, regarding development assistance for mental health. Um, what do you think there are some ways um, in which legislators or policymakers can um, improve that kind of assistance? And uh, can we use existing channels uh, that we have for HIV AIDS or tuberculosis, for example, um, and leverage those um, to become more comprehensive around mental health care as well? Thanks. OK, thanks. So the first question was about uh, women and men, the gender difference in terms of the proportionate increase. Um, uh, one of the main reasons, you know, remember, it's, it's a proportion. So the proportion can go up because other health conditions become less common, not, not, not necessarily because the prevalence of depression or mental health problems have gone up. And in the case of the gender difference, of course, the most important transformation in women's health in the last 25 years has been the reduction of maternal mortality. Uh, it's been quite dramatic. It's one of the great global, alongside HIV AIDS, infant mortality and maternal mortality, as you know, uh, the great global health success stories of our times. Um, so because the proportion of women dying in childbirth has fallen so dramatically, it opens up space, as it were, for other conditions to have an increased burden. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's a relative burden, not an absolute burden. Um, having said this, you know, I don't think one should read this as saying that, so suggesting that men's have fewer mental health problems. Um, I think it's extremely important to recognize that more men die of suicide than women do. Um, and I think men's mental health has been historically, in fact, particularly in the area of mood and anxiety problems, really pushed under the carpet. Um, and many people would argue that um, this is one reason why men often, you know, using, because gender, gender attitudes are much more difficult for men uh, to acknowledge emotional states of distress. 
Um, and so this is one of the theories that you know actually this disadvantages men in ways that we haven't fully acknowledged. And alcohol and substance use may be one way of sublimating, as it were, emotional distress in, 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 into a way which is acceptable for, 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 for men. As far as developer assistance for mental health is concerned, I think this is a really big question. Why do we not feel compassion? I don't know. I mean, you know, I, I was at a recent meeting of a foundation I won't mention, uh, which supports um, maternal health, uh, particularly in the adolescent health for mortal uh, maternal mortality. And you know, we were celebrating that maternal mortality now had fallen very dramatically in countries like India and Sub-Saharan Africa. And then I brought up the point, I said, do you know now what's the most astonishing fact is suicide kills more young women than childbirth does. Um, and um, suicide is now the leading cause of death in young women in Asia. Uh, shouldn't we now act on that? And there was a silence, and it seemed to me that a life lost due to a particular cause has more value than a life lost due to another cause. Uh, and it seems that our compassion and charity is about the cause, not the life lost. Um, and I, 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 I haven't been fully able to figure this out, uh, given that you can prevent suicide. Um, uh, I haven't been able to figure it out. Um, certain countries and certain foundations are beginning to change their attitudes. If I had to be very provocative, I'll tell you why development assistance, uh, you know, northern funders don't fund mental health in the south. It's because those problems haven't been resolved in the north. Uh, so, you know, the problems that people like to fund are things that don't exist anywhere in your backyard. Um, mental illness is in everyone's backyard. So it's almost like this is not their problem, it's my problem here too. So therefore, I'm not going to fund their problem, I'm going to fund something else uh, 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 in those countries which is no longer a problem here. That's my theory, but I don't know, maybe there are others who work in the foundations here who might have better, uh, b better reasons to explain why mental health does not excite the same compassion as other areas of health. Thank you very much, Dr. Patel, and thank you all so much for your questions. Today at the City Club, we've been enjoying a forum featuring Dr. Vikram Patel, Pershing Square Professor of Global Health at Harvard University. Today's forum is sponsored by the Adams Board of Cuyahoga County, the Margaret Clark Morgan Foundation, the Westside Catholic Center, which is celebrating its 40th anniversary, and the Woodruff Foundation. Our community partners are Magnolia Clubhouse and Recovery Resources. Our venue partner is the Global Center for Health Innovation, and our hospitality partner is the Metropolitan at the Nine Hotel. We appreciate the support and sp sponsorship and partnership of all of you. That brings us to the end of our program today. Thank you very much, Dr. Patel. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Our forum is adjourned. <laughs>